form was a neuro exam. Here I'm going to start wrapping in more of the pathology that we see in neurosurgery and the things you will see when you take care of the patients. And I'm going to focus more um, on things, complications, the things that you guys have to be aware of for emergencies. Uh, a lot of things are urgent, but these are more of the emergencies, life and death, that we need to take care of as soon as possible. I'm not including the spine because spine is the next topic. So if anybody's got questions for spine, we'll be next week. Um, first of all, um, bacterial meningitis. In neurosurgery, bacterial meningitis is something that happens in delayed fashion. It doesn't happen in the acute phase, but something that happens in the acute phase after someone has brain surgery, they can have nucleoregidity, photophobia, but that's just irritation from red blood cells. Um, and if you get cortical irritation from surgery, you just treat it with a low-dose steroids, patient symptoms improve, and uh, they stop complaining of the headache. Bacterial meningitis usually happens in someone who has got a ventriculostomy, someone who's been in the ICU for several days, and again, uh, things that can cause uh, meningitis, uh, bacteria, the most serious, viruses, fungus. Fungus is something that we sometimes forget, and whenever we send the gram stain culture, we have to include the fungus, or else it's not going to be able, we're not be able to see. Also, other things, environmental toxins, heavy metals, things can also cause meningitis, but it's not bacterial meningitis. Um, and the concern about bacterial meningitis, it can cause to, uh, brain edema, swelling, and even necrosis and death. Um, again, uh, it usually happens, uh, and you'll see those patients who start having the, the bacteria in their brain, it usually happens 24 hours after surgery. So it doesn't happen immediately. Here, the patient will start having some symptoms of headache, but after brain surgery, everybody's got a headache. Everybody's complaining of headache, nausea, vomiting. But here, we're going to have a couple things to add. If someone's HIV positive, if someone has immunosuppressed and chemotherapy agents, those are the patients who the clinical picture is going to be different. Uh, these patients are going to start having seizures. They're going to start having other presentations other than headache. Again, the, the classic symptoms of meningitis is fever, headaches, stiff neck. If they're immunosuppressed, you probably won't see any fever. <coughs> headaches, if they're on steroids, you probably won't have any headache. The, the neck stiffness is something that is very, uh, it depends on patient on patient. The headache is caused from irritation of the meninges, and it just causes the patients to say that if they're moving their neck, it hurts. There's old signs, Karen and Brzezinski, to tell you the truth, they're so hard to try and distinguish them. Um, clinically, for textbook and, put, uh, and, and uh, you know, exam purposes, yes, there are ways to diagnose them, but they're very hard. Um, does anybody recall the carrying of resisti? You flex the head and uh, the legs straighten, or you bend the legs and, the and they start having some symptoms. These are old um, findings, clinical signs, that are very hard to be able to now correlate if someone has meningitis. There are things we need to know, but practically they're not very easy to use. Again, this is a, a specimen, a pathology specimen, and in this patient, the meningitis, you can see already that there is starting to be some purulent formation over the meninges. And this is a patient who died. This patient was HIV positive. Um, again, classic symptoms. Headache occurs in 90% of the patients. Stiff neck occurs in 85%. And someone who has fevers, chills, 90%. But remember, what else do every, everybody comes in with a headache if they have brain surgery. Everybody comes in with stiff neck if they have any neurosurgical procedure where blood, especially if we had surgery, blood drips down on their brain, patients can have a stiff neck. Vomiting. Vomiting is very low. And here, the vomiting was the typical projectile vomiting if someone has meningitis. I've seen patients who don't have meningitis who have projectile vomiting. And you know, everybody sees these. Uh, but these are the clinical findings that we have in our textbook, but what we really see is a little different. The photophobia. Most patients who have brain surgery have photophobia. Confusion, seizures. Seizures would mean that the patient already has so much cortical irritation that they're starting to go into status. And I'll go over seizures as another neurosurgical emergency. Um, this one is uh, epidural abscess. And uh, epidural abscess are common in the ER. They're usually in patients who are IV drug users. And uh, the thing that the patients usually complain of, back pain. And again, IV drug users go to the ER. They're always looking for pain medications. But we also have to consider 
that this is something that this patient can have. <clears throat> People who come to the ER, history of IV drug use, and having a lot of back pain, out of proportionate to the regular x-ray where they didn't see anything or a CT scan, always keep it in the back of your mind that this could be an epidural abscess. And if epidural abscess is not treated, the patient can be paralyzed permanently. So it's important to be able to see if someone's got uh, spinal epidural abscess, a patient could be, have symptoms of meningitis, and again, back pain, fever, make sure that you're trying to rule this out. The easiest way to rule this out is an MRI. I wouldn't put a needle to someone who's got an epidural abscess because what you're going to do is you're going to put bacteria now intrathecally. Okay? But uh, it usually happens that uh, during the workup, people always forget that uh, spinal epidural abscess is a pathology frequently seen. To diagnosis, yes? How, how is this happening? How is the epidural abscess? Yeah, abscess? why is it why is it coming with these people, and what's the? And, and, and the, what happens is, uh, I, if you're an IV drug user, you're showing directly into a vein, mm -hmm. and so what's happening in these patients? You can have vegetations in the heart, you can have septic emboli, but in the back, the way it happens is you have a lumbar plexus, and it usually happens that in this lumbar plexus, bacteria start leaking around, and it forms an epidural abscess. And so you can have the lumbar epidural, thoracic epidural. Why in the spine does it happen? The disc space has very minimal blood flow to it. So bacteria like finding the disc space, and they colonize the disc space because there's no, bacteria, there's no blood flow getting there. It's a, a, a place where it has all the nutrients, but minimal blood and less white blood cells to fight off infection. So epidural abscess is usually associated with a discitis. They, they get the disguises and then it goes into an epidural abscess. Co uh, again, for diagnosis, <coughs> CBC, everybody can have an elevated white blood cell count. ESR and CRP are usually a red flags. If someone comes in with a C ESR and I forgot a CRP, uh, then you have to rule out why is there an active infection. ESR can be caused from many things. If you're in a trauma, if you had recent surgery, your ESR is elevated but the CRP is more specific for infection. And then blood cultures. Uh, again, usually they say someone has back pain, they got a blood culture, and it's positive for, for instance, Staph aureus. This is the most common organism found. If the patient is, again, if you have immunosuppression, it could be anything. So someone who's immunosuppressed, you have to actually look for something. The weirdest things usually happen to the patient immunosuppression. You can have bacteria that pneumocystis carini, you're going to have other things that don't usually occur. Um, and why? Because immunosuppression, what happens is anything that is normally in someone's skin can colonize something and cause an infection. MRI is the best modality. And the reason I'm saying is if you get an LP, you can put bacteria inside. And here, this is a patient who had discitis. This is the cervical spine. This is a uh, C2, this is atlas axis, this is the base of the cerebellum, this is the spinal cord. This that you see enhancing here, that's infection. You shouldn't have this enhancement. These are the bones, C2, C2 is okay, C3, C4, and C5 are affected. And the infection started in this discitis and caused this epidural abscess. This patient was having weakness, upper extremity weakness, complaining of severe pain, and people thought this patient was just seeking drugs. Again, in basic neuro exam, if you see someone who is myelopathic, there's something wrong, something compressing the spinal cord. How do you know someone's myelopathic? Reflexes, check the reflexes. Increase reflexes. Other thing, look at the exam, check the strength, try and figure out what's wrong. Weakness in the hands, you can have spasticity. All these things can point to someone who's got compression of their spinal cord. Again, compression of the spinal cord, with uh, fever, chills, elevated blood cell count, um, ESR is elevated too, get an MRI. And you can ask the MRI to be done as a scout. They can do an MRI on the full spine and just to try and look for any compression. And they can go back and give contrast. This is with contrast, that's why it enhances like this. Um, the surgery is sometimes necessary. And, and the reason I'm, I wrote is, is necessary in patients who are neurologically compromised. If patient's intact, has a lot of pain, and it usually happens if they're in the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine 
the spinal cord ends at L2. So at L1, L2. The spinal cord beyond that is not there, only nerve roots. And someone has an epidural abscess in the lower lumbar spine, you don't have to treat it with surgery unless there's neurologic compromise. Um, and how to treat this? Decompression, you, you have to remove the spinous processes or the lamina and wash this out. And it's usually pus, frank pus. And then what you have to do is treat these patients with IV antibiotics at least for four to six weeks. Again, depending on the organism is how you're gonna treat. And then you're gonna follow the spinal epidural abscesses with CRP or, uh, or, and ESRs. And this is to make sure that the infection is clearing. Again, if someone had recent spine surgery, always a concern if there's any change in spinal abscesses. Brain abscesses. Um, again, I, I talked about IV drug users. IV drug users, like, because they're injecting it through the IV. And I don't know if you ever, anybody's seen how a drug, uh, IV drug user uses. He, um, they take whatever drug of choice, they put a little spoon in, they heat it up. Some of them are clean enough to drop a little cotton ball to clear the impurities and then inject it. But it's not sterile. So everything they're injecting is directly into their bloodline, blood system. And these patients can have, um, and, and they can have vegetations in their heart. And in these vegetations, they can start uh, peeling off and then they go directly to your brain. Um, one thing that can happen with this, with the abscess, if a patient has other things, for instance, a patent foramen ovale, or a tetralogy, patients can have a higher risk of abscesses. Why? Because the, normally, if you inject blood into the vein, it goes through the, it goes through the liver, then goes through the heart, through the lungs, and up to the brain. But if in, there is a tendency <coughs> of the venous and arterial blood flow, the blood can go across and the bacteria can be sent up. Or, like I said, the vegetations off the valves that are coming on the arterial side, those will embolize to the brain. I've got some pictures here. And this is someone who's got uh, multiple brain abscesses. This is a CT scan of the head. Uh, and this is a young person. Um, had uh, a, a tetralogy of follow up. And, and here, the brain abscess enhancing lesion in the frontal lobe, and there are two right here. A CT scan doesn't give you a diagnosis. A CT scan tells you that there is an enhancing lesion, but other tumors can look like this. So the way to diagnose this would be with blood cultures. And, and here I kind of wrote out the most common. Uh, for instance, in children, it's different bacteria depending on the age. And uh, for me, I had to memorize this for boards because in certain years of age of children, E. coli, H. fluenza, staph, and then patients who have cyanotic heart disease. You can be strep or strep aureus. Um, Ground negative rods, fungal organisms, uh, aspergillosis, patients who have, are under chemotherapy agents, can have, again, strange organisms that can cause brain abscess. These patients who have fungal uh, are usually immunosuppressed and are the ones that usually don't survive. When I go back to the CT, the emergency is not the abscess. The emergency is that if this abscess ruptures into the ventricles, well, the patient will die from acute ventriculitis. A brain abscess is not emergent if it's small, well encapsulated, but if it's in the ventricle, then you have to try and take the abscess out. And the way to do it is a craniotomy and take out the, the pus inside and clean out the membrane, the capsule. Of it. How to diagnose this? Laboratory, not really healthy. Uh, most common symptoms, headaches. Again, almost anything can give you a headache. 50% uh, of them have fevers. And, and this is what I was talking about. Abscesses greater than three centimeters should be drained. There's a mortality of doing surgery, 25%. Uh, patients should be started in triple antibiotics. And I forgot to mention that, and also in meningitis. If you're not sure what's going on, and the patient has clinical signs of meningitis, the white blood cell count shows of, of the uh, I'm sorry, the uh, CSF shows elevated white blood cell count, the bacteria there. You're supposed to do a triple antibiotic until the cultures are back, okay? And then seizures frequently occur in these patients. And these patients need to have antiepileptics from one to two years. Okay. Any questions? Um, why is it that uh, ventricular infections are so much uh, 
requires so much more why they 